All right, guys, we're going to go through the exercises from Futado Lessons 22 and 23 here. I know there's a lot, but these are pretty straightforward. So um, what I'm going to do, since you've got the basic translations, and I didn't really get any questions on any of this stuff, is I'm going to go through here just looking for the particular um, clues that I think are helpful or looking for the particular uh, confusing parts that might be tricky to kind of help you through that. So um, basically, these are going to be practicing both your translation of prepositions and your translation of the pronoun suffixes. Remember, these pronoun suffixes, um, there's only two sets of them. There's what I call type one or set one and set two. And set one gets used on some prepositions. Other prepositions use set two. Fotado calls them suffixes that go on singular nouns and suffixes that go on plural nouns. But I feel like that's a little bit confusing because these exact same suffixes go on a lot more than just nouns. As we go through here, you need to understand what type of word the pronoun is attached to so that you know how the pronoun is functioning. If it's, if it's attached to a preposition, the pronoun's going to be functioning as the object of that preposition. So for the Lamed preposition, when we've got the three MS suffix here, it's going to be to or for him. Him would be how we translate the third masculine singular pronoun when it's an object. So object just means that it is the one that um, the action or the relationship is going toward, that sort of idea. So to him or for him. Number two, we've got two ms. So this is bacha. Bacha would be in him, or I'm sorry, in you, masculine singular, with you, um, by you possibly. A lot of different options there. Uh, you can see in ima that im, which is usually just i and mem by itself, um, but when we've got this sub, uh, this pronoun suffix here, uh, you see that uh, geminate mem in the form of the dagesh. So that's what's going on here is uh, im is actually a uh, geminate preposition, uh, and you lose that second consonant, that second doubled consonant when it's uh, when it doesn't have a suffix. But then when you put the suffix on there, you see it appear in the form of the strong dagesh. The tohi, lach, pretty straightforward. Imahem, uh, so three mp. Uh, the cough here, this is going to be uh, 3FS, or I'm sorry, 2FS. Uh, Anu here, we've got the 1CP. All of these are pretty straightforward, no strange forms yet. Uh, Bachem, 2MP. Lachain, 2FP. Elav, this is that. L is, one of, L is one of those prepositions that takes the uh, type 2 endings, and so that's why you've got this. Ptachiod, Vav, but remember the Vav is the common element in the three ms suffixes number 11 uh, we've got the echa so again that's a type 2 ending type 2 suffix uh, but again the cough comets should be that common theme there for 2 ms uh, so this would be something like upon you uh lift nigh lift nigh here this is going to be so lift nay is before or in the presence of it literally means to the face of uh lift nigh here has the one cs suffix that go the type 2 one cs suffix and so uh, this would just be like before me or in my presence uh, this is 3FS. Again, that is the type 2 ending. And I, the one reason why I think it's helpful to distinguish these as type 1 and type 2 rather than, you know, uh, suffixes that go on singular nouns and suffixes that go on plural nouns is because when you get to prepositions or you get to infinitives, that sort of a thing where we're applying these, those aren't plural. You know, there aren't singular prepositions and plural prepositions. So uh, think of them as just two sets and plural nouns take one set and singular nouns take another set. As far as the prepositions go, why do some prepositions take type two and others take type one? There may be a reason for that. I don't know of a reason, it's just sort of convention. So certain prepositions will use type one consistently, others will use type two consistently. All right, uh, elenu, this is one CP. Again, the new is the common suffix between type one and type two for one CP. So this would be like uh, into us or toward us. Uh, lifnehem, this is going to be before them. Hem is that 3MP suffix. Tachatenu, this is going to be um, that 3FS suffix again. That he, comets, is the common theme. In the type 1 endings, it's comets he with a mapik, and in the type 2, it's he, comets. So just a different order there, but that's still a common theme between the 3FS. All right, so we've got the enu, uh, lifne hem. Uh, hem is going to be the 3MP again. Uh, Tachatenu, this is the uh, 1CP alechem. This is going to be um, the 2MP suffix. And a like, this is the uh, f type 1 uh, 2FS suffix. So 2U, uh, Lifnehen. This is going to be before or in the presence of them feminine. And Elechen, again, the Ken is going to be the common uh, commonality between type 1 and type 2. 
Number 21, we've got Imanu. Again, we've got that doubled mem uh, for the geminate im, but this is going to be the new suffix, so one CP is to be like with us. Um, Lifnenu, this is going to be in our presence or before us. And Li would be for me or to me. All right, number 24, Eli. We've got the 1CS suffix, so this would be to me or for me or maybe not for to me or toward me or into me, something like that. Uh, Banu, this is going to be 1CP, so this would be at us, with us, uh, maybe even among us would be a possibility there. Number five, we start off with an adjective that we recognize because this is the lexical form, the masculine singular, gadol. We notice that it does not have an article and it's obviously going to precede any noun it might be modifying, uh, unless it's substantival, because it's the first word of the sentence. So we're thinking great is, or large is, ha'ish, the man. So this uh, ha'ish and gadol match each other, or they agree and gender a number. So there's a probably a predicative relationship here. Great is the man who, assure, amadnu lifnav. Amadnu, uh, this is going to be the cowperfect 1CP form of amad. Amad means uh, to to stand, basically. Uh, great is the man who, okay, so here Asher can't be the subject of Ahmad Nu because it's a first person plural and the man who, this man is third person singular. So this must be the man whom we stand before him. Now I know that this says before him, this is called a resumptive object or a resumptive pronoun in Hebrew. And a lot of times you will have on a preposition a, um, in English, it comes off as um, superfluous. It comes off as um, unnecessary. We don't need it here. But uh, Hebrew will often just reiterate that pronoun when you've got a, uh, it's kind of like how in English you, oops, it's kind of like how in English you're not supposed to end a sentence with a preposition. Well, in Hebrew here, this would end with a preposition. So they put the object on there. You're not going to want to translate that object into the English sentence because it's not good English. We wouldn't we wouldn't repeat that preposition here. We would just say, great is the man before whom we stand. We would actually take the preposition and put it before, um, no pun intended, before the relative pronoun here. But my guess is this is, great is the man whom we stand before. That doesn't sound great in English, so you would say, great is the man before whom we stood, I guess would be the proper rendering of a mod new here. So let's see what Futato says. Great is the man before whom we... Oh, the man before whom we stood is great. Okay, so um, that that obviously is a proper translation as well. It's a little bit more... Uh, let me pull this down so I can... The man before whom we stood is great. The important idea is here to kind of dig in a little bit. Predicative uh, relationship between the adjective and the noun. The main verb in this sentence um, is tricky. Uh, <laughs> you want to think that it's going to be a mod new because it's an actual verbal conjugation, but a mod new is part of this relative <coughs> clause. And so if you start off your translation, a lot of times I'll say, you know, when you go to build it in English, say, Hey English, what do you want first to begin your sentence? And English will usually say, give me the subject first. And you go through here and you got to wonder, okay, what's the subject of the sentence? Is it we, is it the man? What is it? Well, the relative clause is always going to be subordinate to the main clause. And so your main clause here is a verbless clause in Hebrew. It's just great is the man or the man is great. Now in English, we, we're pretty flexible with where relative clauses can go in a sentence. And so if you keep the relative clause in the same order of the sentence as the Hebrew here, you get great is the man whom we stood before. Uh, but again, that doesn't quite, it, it feels awkward in English. And so English, you have an opportunity to kind of move this around a little bit. Just make sure you're not changing the meaning. And by that, I mean, make sure you're not making an object a subject. Make sure you're not changing the function of any of the words in the sentence. But by all means, please do play around with the translation into English so that you can get a smooth sounding English. Remember, a good English translation has to be good English. You can't have a good English translation that's not good English. And so there is an element of we have to kind of play around with it a little bit to um, make it sound like we speak in English. Just make sure you're not changing the function of the words. All right, so number one, we're looking at Yom Adonai Hagadol. And what we're going to do is, just like any translation, we're going to start one word at a time. We're going to analyze each word, and then we're going to, uh, after that, build this, I guess it's not a sentence, but build the phrase in English. So we start off with Yom. We get, this is the idea of day or time period, something like that. 
It is in construct. That's not obvious because the spelling of yom doesn't change when it goes in construct. It has an unchangeably long vowel. Uh, it does lose its accent, but the spelling looks the same. So yom adonai, you can think of as a maybe a compound word in Hebrew, yom adonai. And then we've got Hagadol. Hagadol has the Hepatak Dagesh. We take that off, we get Gadol, which is great, the adjective great. Um, could be large, depending on what we're modifying. But we have to decide, how is this adjective functioning? Is it standing on its own, the great thing, the great one? Is it predicative, where we would say, uh, the day of the Lord is great? Is it attributive, where we would say something like, the great day of the Lord, or the day of the great Yahweh, or the, the great Lord? I mean, that depends. Uh, on, on a lot of different things contextually. Here you don't have much context. You've got three words. So let's just translate it both ways because we have a masculine singular adjective and we have two masculine singular nouns. So grammatically, this adjective could go with either noun. Now it's only going to go with one and we have to determine which one is more likely. But if we translate it first as modifying yom, we can build our sentence in English by asking how does English build an attributive adjectival phrase? And English would start with the article, if any, the, then the adjective, then the noun. You know, different languages do it differently. So Spanish, for example, would go article, noun, adjective. But in English, we go article, adjective, noun. So we would say the great day of the Lord, the great day of the Lord. That would be one translation here. But what if Hagadol modifies Adonai? This is possible, but Adonai does not often have a modifying adjective. Um, in fact, most personal names don't. And so it's unlikely, I would say, that Hagadol is modifying Adonai, but let's just translate it as if it were. You might expect, uh, if Hagadol were modifying Yom, you might expect it to be closer to Yom. But because these two words are in construct, the adjective cannot break that chain. It, you can't just insert an adjective in here. So the adjective has to come outside the chain. You could argue that it would make more sense for it to be Yom if Hagadol were in front, but attributive adjectives tend to come after their noun anyway. So that's not really enough to tip it one way or the other. If we translate this phrase as Hagadol modifying Adonai, we would get something like the day of the great Lord or the day of the great Adonai. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If, uh, if Adonai or any personal name is going to take an adjective, it's probably going to be in the predicative uh, position rather than attributive. So I would translate this as the great day of the Lord or the great day of Adonai, however you prefer to translate that here. Number two, we have Sava ha shemayim ha rav. Sava here, this is in construct visibly because Sava usually has the kametz kametz. And here we've got Shava kametz. So you can tell that the spelling is a little bit different. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, I, I didn't memorize the vowel pointing for Sava, so I don't know that that's in construct. That's fine. I tell you to pay most attention to the letters anyways and let the vowels sort of um, guide you once you've got a good handle on what you're looking at. So you don't need to have memorized. You can just sort of tell that if this were absolute, and again, this goes back to some of the syllable rules for Hebrew, which Fatata doesn't go deeply into, but if this were absolute, what we would have here is an open pre-tonic syllable. Pre-tonic means it's before the tone or before the accent. And open pre-tonic, that is the syllable right before the accent, those are usually long vowels in Hebrew. And that's why tzava, in its absolute form, has the um, the kamets here. So when you see the shava, you, you get an idea that it has reduced somewhat. And so that, that's what tells us this is the construct spelling. So tzava is a word for host, like a large group or an army. And it is in construct with hashamayim. Okay, so hashamayim is the sky or the heavens. So this would be the host or the army. We say the because the definiteness of the construct depends on the definiteness of its absolute. The army of the heavens or the army of the sky, harav. Okay, so harav. Is harav modifying the army? Or the sky. Now here, Shemayim is in the dual form, but it's always in the dual form. So you may wonder, does it take a singular or a dual adjective? Well, adjectives don't conjugate in dual here. So just by knowing that we've got masculine singular adjective with a masculine singular noun, harav, the um, the rav, we usually translate rav as much or many. That doesn't work here. If it's modifying host, we would have to say something like the numerous. Halo recommends great, which would be similar to gadol, but the idea is not size, the idea is quantity. So great here does not necessarily refer to size, it just refers, that, that's the primary difference between gadol and rav. Gadol is going to be size, rav is going to be quantity. So we have the army of the heavens, the great, which would be the great army of the heavens. Number three, reshit darcho ha tova. So reshit is going to be beginning, and then Darko is going to be his path or his way. Reshit Darko, these are both nouns. And so 
since these are both nouns, they're probably in a construct relationship, beginning of his path or his way, ha tova. So here we have to figure out what tova is modifying. Is it modif modifying the sheet or darko? So the problem with derech is that Hallo says it is singular feminine, but it's also masculine in the plural. Uh, it looks like it can also be singular masculine, uh, but in the plural it's always masculine. This is similar to the noun ruach. Uh, ruach can take a uh, feminine adjective or a uh, masculine adjective. All right, so since darko can be either masculine or feminine, since it can take a masculine or feminine adjective, I'm going to translate this both ways. So this would be either the good beginning of his path, or maybe derech here would be journey, the good beginning of his journey, or the beginning of his good journey. I don't really like either one. I would need more context to understand what that means. Is the beginning good? Like, what makes a good beginning, uh, attributively? But also, what makes a good journey? I mean, is it a journey toward a good purpose? So it's a little ambiguous here. Not a great example, I don't think. All right, number four, zivche ha kohen ha tave. Zivche here, we can see this is in construct. We've got the masculine plural construct ending. So this would be sacrifices of the priest. So this would be the sacrifices of the priest. Hatame, since hatame is masculine singular, it has to modify kohen. So this would be the sacrifices of the unclean priest. Again, in English, we have to put the adjective before the noun it modifies, which is why we say the sacrifices of the unclean priest, whereas Hebrew can just stick the adjective after its noun. Number five, we've got davar ha neveim ha reshaim. Here we see that our adjective reshaim is masculine plural, and the noun ha neveim is masculine plural, but davar is masculine singular. So this would have to be the word because it's the prophet. The definiteness of the construct depends on the definiteness of the absolute. The word of the, and then we need the adjective before the noun it modifies. So the adjective would be the word of the wicked prophet. Number six, we've got yame ha shana ha tovim. Yame has the masculine plural construct ending, so we know that we've got a construct chain here. Yame is the masculine plural construct of yom, so this would be the days of the year, the good ones. Since hatovim is plural and hashana is singular, hatovim cannot modify hashana; it has to modify yave. So here we have the good days of the year, and again, that translation is building it back in English, okay? So how do I know to say good before, like how do I know to say in this order, the and then good? So I'm jumping from here to here. I guess you could say I'm jumping from here, back here up to here. Well, that's because in English, if we want to say that there are days of a year and that those days of the year are good in an attributive function, we start with the article, adjective, and then the noun. And then we put this determinant around here, of the year. The good days of the year. Torat Adonai Ha Tehora. So here Ha Tehora is our adjective. It's got a definite article. It's feminine singular. Adonai is masculine singular. Torat is feminine singular. So Tahor, this means pure. This is going to go with instruction. So however we translate this construct phrase, we're going to describe the instruction as good. I'm sorry, as pure. All right, so we've got instruction of Adonai. Now the definiteness of the construct depends on the definiteness of its absolute. Here the absolute has no article. However, it is a personal name, which is a type of proper noun. Any sort of proper noun is definite by default. And so Torah will also be definite. This will be the pure instruction of the Lord. Number eight, here we have Berit Eloheinu ha sorry, ha Zechena is uh, old, uh, elder, um, aged, a lot of different ways you could translate this. It's definite and it has a feminine singular ending. Eloheinu is masculine, uh, plural, at least in form, and Brit is feminine singular. So, Hazakain, elder, um, aged, you might even be able to say former, I'm not sure. But then Berit, uh, this is the noun that gets modified. So this would be, again, the old covenant, the aged, the former, maybe, covenant of Eloheinu. We've got the Yod, Nun, Shurik ending. It's going to be our on Elohim. So altogether, this would be the old covenant of our God. Number nine. Number nine, we have nafshot, ha-amim, ha-tehorot. Ha-tehorot, this is our adjective. It has the article. It has a feminine plural ending. Ha-amim has a masculine plural ending. Nafshot has a feminine plural ending. And so we would translate the pure souls or lives of the peoples. The pure souls of the peoples. Number ten. 
Divre is in construct. We've got the masculine plural construct ending here, Sarayod, with Hanavi. So this would be the words of the prophet. Our adjective is Hagadol. So Hagadol is masculine singular. Divre, this is masculine plural. So Hagadol would have to modify Hanavi. So this would then be the words of the great prophet. Number 11, Adon Kol Haaretz Hagadol. All right, so we've got kind of uh, two. We've got two nouns in construct. Kol is an adjective here. But this would basically be, I suppose, I mean, I suppose this would be functioning substantively. We've got Lord of, all of, the earth. So remember that um, the definiteness of each construct word is dependent upon the definiteness of the absolute. So that would be the Lord of the whole earth. Now we have to figure out where Hagadol fits in. Hagadol does not modify Ha'aretz, because Ha'aretz is feminine. So it would modify Adon. So this would be the great lord of the whole earth, or the whole land. Number 12, we've got Mishpachat HaMelech Hagadol. Mishpachat is in construct. We see the Patak Tav, feminine singular construct ending. So this would be, Mishpacha is the family or the clan of the king, the great. So is it the great family, or is it the great king? Well, Hagadol is masculine singular. Mishpachat is feminine singular. Melek is masculine singular, so this would have to be the family or the clan of the great king. All right, so uh, first verb here, we've got a lot of letters. Uh, Hebrew verbal root has three, so something's extra. What's extra here? Have we added a cough to the beginning? That's possible. We can add a cough preposition to the beginning of an infinitive, uh, fin infinitive construct, but we've got a lot of letters, so that's probably not what we're looking at. Now, I say we've got a lot of letters. That's a bad way to look at it. Number one, uh, five letters here. We got to figure out what's extra. Hopefully, the first thing that jumps out at you is the tem suffix. That tem suffix is a cow perfect uh, two mp suffix, and if you take it off, you get katav, a root that you should recognize from your vocabulary. So this cow perfect two mp from the root katav. Um, you'll note that the uh, the comets in the R1 vowel that we usually see has reduced. That's because this tem suffix has two consonants. We sometimes call this the heavy suffix. And what that means is it's it's so heavy, it's got two full um, consonants and it's, it's, it's a closed syllable. It's actually weighing down the end of the word. And if it's weighing down, it's kind of like, that means that it's pulling all of the, it's pulling all the vowel energy toward the end. That's why it's accented on the final syllable. And since it's pulling all the vowel energy toward the end, that's why we get this reduction here in the first uh, root letter. So again, you don't need to know the rules of why these vowels shift at this point, but for me, I found it helpful to understand, you know, why some of these changes took place. All right, number two, we've got Nehreid. Nehreid, I see a seri seri pattern. When I see a seri seri pattern, the first thing I'm thinking is cal imperfect of a one yod verb, one yod vav, that is. And so uh, what I want to look for when I get that seri seri pattern is I want to look at the letter that is holding the first seri. That letter is probably going to be my prefix letter, and here it's a noon. Noon prefix on a Calum perfect tells me one CP. So right there from the seri seri pattern in the noon, I've been able to parse this as Cal imperfect third masculine, or I'm sorry, first first common plural of now we gotta figure out the root. Well, you just take the noon off because you know that's the prefix, and you have also figured out that this is a one yod vav, so you stick a yod on the front, you get yarad. All right. Number three, we've got asot. Asot here ends in a holom vav tav. That's the thing that my eye is drawn to. When I see a holom vav tav and I know it's a verb, then there's really only a couple options here. This is either going to be a feminine plural participle, but I don't have that O class R1 vowel, or it's going to be the infinitive construct of a third hey verb. If I take the holom vav tav off and I put a hey on there, do I have a root that I recognize? Well, I would have asa, that is a root I recognize. So this is a cal infinitive construct of asa. Number four, we've got bonim. Again, jumps out at me here, this hierarchy yod mem suffix. When I see that on a verb, I'm immediately thinking that this is going to be the uh, cal active participle masculine plural. And I can confirm that with the R1 holum. That tells me that I've got to take off the hierarchy yod mem and I add the hey back on because you'll remember that in the third hey verbs, we will drop the hey out altogether when we're adding a vocalic suffix. That means a suffix that begins with a vowel. And so if we replace the hierarch yod here, hierarch yod mem, with a comet's hey, we would get bona, but that's obviously from bana. So cal active participle masculine plural from bana. Number five, matsanu. Matsanu, this, I mean, again, this really jumps out at me as this new suffix. If you take that off, which by the way is a cal perfect one CP suffix, if you take that off, you're left with matsa, which is just the lexical form that we learned. Matsa means, uh, I'm pretty sure matsa means to look for or to find. And so this would be uh, we found, but it is Cal Perfect 1CP from matsa. Number six, we've got attain. 
Again, this is one of those uh, Natan verbs that you might just be better off memorizing because you get some wacky irregularity in the theme vowel. The one noon often assimilates. It's a mess. But what I do see here is an Aleph Segel prefix. When I see an Aleph Segel in the first root, or let me say it this way. When I see an Aleph Segel in the first letter of a verb, I'm immediately thinking Cal Imperfect 1 CS. If I take that off, I'm left with Tain, but I do have this Dagesh here. Right, this dagesh before a vowel sound is going to be in a tav. If this were a non bagagkafat letter, you would know it's a strong doubling dagesh. But since it's a bagagkafat letter, it could be uh, a weak dagesh, uh, a weak dagesh that begins a new syllable. But if this dagesh is preceded by, if the letter holding this dagesh is preceded by a vowel sound, that's an indication that we've got the strong doubling dagesh. And since we've got the dagesh forte in what would be the second root letter, that's a sign that we're looking at a one noon. So we pull the noon back out, we get natan. So count imperfect one CS from Natan. Number seven, Shevet. We have a Segel Segel Tav pattern. That Segel Segel Tav pattern does appear in a few different types of conjugations. Uh, we see it here, um, and we also see it. So the two primary ones are going to be the Cal active participle feminine singular. You'll often have a Segel Segel Tav ending, but it will usually be a four-letter word. You know, you'll have your root and then Segel Segel Tav at the end. But when you don't have any letter before the segel segel tav pattern, that is to say the segel segel tav begins with the first letter of the word. Sorry if that's confusing. But a segel segel tav pattern on a three-letter word, that's a pretty good sign that you're looking at the infinitive construct of a one yod verb, a one yod vav specifically. So if we take off the segel segel tav pattern and we add a yod back to the first root position, we get yashav. So this would be an infinitive, cal infinitive construct from yashav. Number eight, we have ketov. Now, ketov here has three letters. How many letters should a Hebrew verbal root have? Three. How many do we have? Three. Great. Now we can start thinking, what conjugations give us a three-letter word, a three-letter verb? Not, not root, but what conjugations give us a form with only three letters? The most uh, familiar one is going to be the CalPerfect 3MS. That's just the three root letters with the vowels. The next one that we learned was the infinitive construct. That's where we reduce the first root letter and we have an O class theme vowel because this is built, this form is built on the Cal Imperfect 3MS form. We just remove the prefix from that and that's where we would get Katov and that's what this is. The other forms, other common forms that only have three letters, um, and I should clarify, this is three letters that match the root, okay? So a lot of third hey verbs and one yod verbs and one noon verbs might also only have three letters, but they won't be the root letters. Now. I realize as I say that you're not going to know immediately whether these are the root letters or not. But if you do find a root you recognize, and it's only got three letters, the form only has three letters. So either they're going to be the Cal Perfect 3MS, in which case the first root letter should have a comets. The second root letter usually has a patak, but state of verbs can have a holomorous area here. Um, and then certain third hey, third all of verbs can have a comets here. So that's why I focus on the first root letter vowel. So Cal Perfect 3MS will have a comets in R1. Uh, the infinitive construct will have a shava in R1 or some sort of reduced vowel in R1 and usually a holum in R2. That, that's why we sometimes call this the infinitove because it's got that O theme vowel. You've also got the um, infinitive absolute, which can have three letters. Sometimes it will have a vav letter, or I should say a, it'll have a vav here as part of the holum vav, and so you might count that as four, but that can also be written defectively. And if it's written defectively, uh, your infinitive absolute is actually going to look like an O-class stative verb in the Cal Perfect that's going to have your comets in R1, and it's going to have a holum in R2. That's the infinitive absolute. And when that happens, it's going to have the same vowel pattern as, say, yakol, that comets holum vowel pattern. Uh, often, we're used to seeing the infinitive absolute with that vav letter, but it doesn't always have it. So, again, Cal infinitive construct from Katov. Number nine, lakod. Here we've got that holum vav. R2 vowel. We've got the comets in R1, so this is going to be a Cal infinitive absolute from Lakad. And then number 10, we've got Ya'alu. Ya'alu. We've got this um, Patak Hatef Patak vowel pattern at the beginning. That is an indication that we are dealing with a one gutter. That's not the right way to say that. That happens because we're dealing with a one guttural. This is an important thing to realize, though. This pattern will also be very common in a different conjugation that we'll learn later. I should say a different pattern that we'll learn later. But at this point, we can explain the patak, patak shava by means of the ayin here. The ayin does not want a silent shava under it, so it takes the hatef vowel. 
It takes the composite Shiva, and it chooses the Hata Patach because Ayan has a strong preference for the Patach. Then, in order to um, agree or to accommodate that Hatef Patach, where we would usually have a Hiric vowel in the prefix of a cow imperfect, that uh, Hiric is going to shift to a Patach to match the composite Shiva of the Ayan. And that, that makes the Ayan really happy because now it's got an A-class vowel in front of it and an A-class vowel behind it. It's feeling good. So that's why we've got this unique pattern here in the Cal Imperfect. When we get to the Hifil Imperfect, that's a different pattern of the Imperfect. When we get to that, we'll see that that pattern consistently has a Patak prefix vowel instead of a Hiric prefix vowel. And in that case, there may be situations where the Hifil and the uh, Cal Imperfect look very similar, if not identical. Okay, but we'll, we'll worry about that later. All right, so that's E. Looking at F, we've got some more translations here. Let's look at number three here. All right, number three, we begin with Nevi. Now, Nevi here, you may not recognize this because um, you're not necessarily paying super close attention to the vowels all the time. But Nevi here is spelled a little bit differently than the way we learned it. We learned it with a Kometz under the noon. Here it's got a Shiva. That tells us that this is in construct, all right? So if Nevi is in construct, it wouldn't necessarily be profit, it would be profit of. Again, that of is just a gloss to put in there to remind you that it's in construct with most likely the noun following it. All right, so nevi is profit. Um, it's a noun. We're not quite sure the function of this noun yet in the sentence, but um, it doesn't have a definite article. Well, that doesn't mean much because, again, the construct noun won't have a definite article, even if it's definite, because the definiteness of a construct noun depends on the definiteness of its absolute. So let's continue this construct chain until we get to an absolute. All right, so we get our next word is the, the divine name, Adonai, the Lord here. So this would be the prophet of the Lord. Now, is Adonai in construct? Well, I don't know if we're going to see any vowel changes with the divine name in construct. I personally just don't know that. So the way to check and be sure is to see, is there an absolute noun after Adonai? And the next uh, word, I can tell this is a verb, this is not a noun, so it won't be in construct. So Adonai here, this is a personal name, which means that it is a proper noun, and proper nouns are, by default, definite. So even though Adonai does not have an article here, it is definite and it is the absolute, that means that Navi is also definite. So this would actually be the prophet of the Lord. All right, so that is a noun phrase, the prophet of the Lord. We're still not sure how it's functioning in the sentence yet because we don't know what else is in the sentence, but that's a good gloss for this section. Next, we have Yehreid. Now, yay raid, we see the seri-seri pattern. Seri-seri pattern indicates the cal imperfect of a one yod vav, and that means that this first yod is not the root letter, this first root yod is the prefix letter. I go to the first seri and I look at what letter is holding the first seri. That will help me parse the word. So when does the cal imperfect have a yod prefix? It's only in the third masculine, and when there's no suffix, it's third masculine singular. So this is a cal imperfect 3ms form of, again, the yod here is not the root, so my root letters are Resh and Dalet. I'm missing a letter. What letter am I missing? Well, we already said that this is the pattern of the Cal Imperfect of a one Yod Vav. So that means that the first root letter should be Yod. Okay, so it's the same as this letter, but this is the prefix Yod, not the root Yod. So we add a Yod back on for the root. We get Yarad. Yarad means he descended or he went down. And in the Imperfect 3MS, it would mean he will go down. So... We're a little bit out of order if Navi is our subject, because the subject will often come after the verb. So perhaps Navi Adonai has some other function. We're not sure yet. Let's keep going. But certainly Yehreid is a, a main verb. Uh, un we don't have any indication that we're in a subordinate clause at this point. We seem to be in a main clause, and we've got a, a verb here, so this is probably our main verb. All right. Now, if Navi Adonai is not the subject, then we would expect the subject to come after Yehreid. Yehreid is followed not by a noun, but by min, the min preposition. So min is modifying the action of the, of the verb. He descended. How did he descend? He descended from hahar. Hahar, I see a hey. Hey, that might be the Hebrew definite article. So if I take off the hey and the kametz, now the kametz is not a patak dagesh, but that's because I can't use a patak dagesh on a guttural like hey here. So I take off the hey kametz, I'm left with har. That is the word for mountain or hill or something like that. So he... Uh, the prophet of the Lord, if this is the subject, will go down, come down, descend from the mountain. Then I've got likro. All right, so likro, I have to figure out what, what am I looking at here? Is this a noun, verb, adjective? What type of word is this? Hopefully, you'll get to a point where you start to see roots jumping out at you or 
uh, suffixes or prefixes jumping out at you. But early on, this probably just looks like an unfamiliar combination of letters. You know, you could, again, I don't want you to think it's always going to be this way. The more practice you get, the more intuitive and automatic this process becomes. But at the very beginning, you might have to start asking yourselves like, you might have to start asking yourselves questions like, okay, what combination of letters here is familiar? Is there any place where I see a Lamed, Kof, Resh together? Is there any place where I see a Kof, Resh, Aleph together? Just trying to get yourself toward a root, because even the noun roots and the adjective roots are still usually based on a three-letter root. So if you can get yourself to somewhere, three letters that are familiar. Now, if it's a verb, a lot of times you're going to have letters drop out, uh, root letters drop out, and so you may not see anything. But if you're just looking at this and saying, asking yourself, what do I recognize here? Hopefully, one thing that you'll recognize is the potentiality that a word that begins with a lamed might be the lamed preposition. All right. Now, the lamed preposition usually has a shava, but when we add it to a word that already has a shava in the first letter, we can't have two shavas at the beginning of a Hebrew word. So that first shava is actually going to uh, restore to a short vowel, and usually that's going to be hirik. Sometimes it's patach, but usually it's going to be hirik here. So if lamed is a preposition and we take it off, what are we left with? We're left with kof, resh, aleph. Now, is this a root that we've seen before? We have seen this in the verbal root kara, which means to... Kara uh, is used a couple different ways. Kara kind of literally means to call out. But uh, kara is also the verb that is used for to read, or it is a verb that is used for reading. And that may sound a little bit weird to connect it with call out, but in the ancient world... Um, I don't know that they never read silently like we do today, but certainly it was much more common to read out loud in the ancient world. And so kara is more the idea of to read aloud. Um, now, I shouldn't say that. When it's used for reading, when it's in the context of a document or something like that, uh, it has the idea of to read out. Uh, but it literally means to, to say something out loud, to call out, something like that. So uh, if we take this as our root, how, what, what do we see here with the pattern? Well, we see the three root letters. So that's a, that's a big step. The three root letters here, there's only a few conjugations where that's all we have. We've already talked about how the lamet is not part of the conjugation. It's a preposition. So three root letters, this might be the CalPerfect 3MS, which it's not because then we would have a Kametz in R1. It might be the infinitive construct, which actually matches quite well. That's where we expect a Shiva in R1 and a Holom in R2, and that's what we've got. Now, the other possibilities are the infinitive absolute, in which case we have a long vowel in R1, which we do not have here. And then finally, it could be the Calactive Participle Masculine Singular. And that's not what we have either, because that would start that would have a holum vowel in R1. So this is an infinitive construct of kara. The lamed preposition goes on infinitive constructs quite well. Often it marks a complementary infinitive, which is an infinitive that sort of complements the activity of the main verb, or the lamed preposition can mark purpose or intention. And so it would be modifying the main verb. He went down to call, to call out. Or depending on what we have coming here, it might be to read out. So the prophet of the Lord will go down, sorry, the prophet of the Lord will go down from the mountain to call out, to call aloud, to read aloud. Et. Et tells me that I've got a definite object here. A definite object, not an object of the main verb, but an object of the infinitive. So to call out what? To call out the document. Et sefer. Now sefer here doesn't have an article but it's got the definite direct object marker. What is going on here? Why no definite article? Well, Sefer is actually in construct, and I'm a little bit curious whether this should still be a Sere. I'm not sure about that, but you don't need to worry about it, okay? So Sefer here, this is going to be uh, the book, and we know that for a couple reasons. One, it's got the definite direct object marker on it, so it's definite, even though it has no article. Two, if we follow this construct chain out to its absolute, we will see that the absolute is also definite but we're going to do this one word at a time. So Sefer is going to be scroll of, document of, book of. Uh, so to read the book of Torah, again, Torah here is going to be definite because we've already established that the construct chain is definite. The scroll or book of the instruction of Haberit. Now Haberit has to be the absolute because we do have a definite article here. So this definite article tells us that we're no longer in construct. This is the absolute that, that anchors the construct chain. So the book of the instruction of Habrit, the covenant. 
All right. So um, moving on to the next word here, then we've got Alechem. Alechem, if you're not quite familiar, I mean, all of these letters are very common. There are a lot of possibilities here if, if you're not used to seeing Alechem in this form. So you have to start asking yourself, what might be added on to a root form? And the first thing that jumps out at me is the chem suffix. The chem suffix is usually an indication of the pronoun suffix as second masculine plural, but it's also got the sere yod in front of it. So this is that type two pronoun suffix, second masculine plural. If I take those off, I get aleph lamed, which could be el, god. It could be el, the preposition. Um, this would either be your god, actually your gods, or this would be to you all. Which one makes the most sense? Now, I'll tell you right now, if it were gods, it would not have the hatef patak here. But you don't know that. So let's just translate through and see what the options are. The prophet of the Lord will go down from the mountain in order to read out the book of the instruction of the covenant, your gods. Now, this can't be of your gods because habrit is not in construct. We've established that's absolute. The sentence might make sense if it was to read out the book of the instruction of the covenant of your gods. That might make some sense. But it can't be of your gods because Brit would have to also be in construct to say of. So this would just be to read the book of the instruction of the covenant, your gods. It doesn't really work. Uh, there's not a clear function for your gods in the sentence. But if we translate this as to you all, to read the book of the instruction of the covenant to you all, well, that makes sense because to you all is a prepositional phrase that's modifying the infinitive uh, to read out, to read out to you all the book of the instruction of the covenant. So final translation here, the prophet of the Lord will go down from the mountain in order to read out the book of the instruction of the covenant to you. Tata says the prophet of the Lord will come down from the mountain to read the book of the law of the covenant. So he just translates Torah as law. Torah as law, uh, book of the law of the covenant to you. All right. Chapter 23, activity A. Translate the following, paying attention to the difference between past, present, positive, and negative. Okay, so haya, I see haya. Again, in like in your reading in the Bible, you're not going to be as primed to look out for what you're looking out for here. He's telling you that you've got this issue of past, present. You've got this issue of positive and negative. You're dealing with particles of existence. You're primed to recognize stuff here. If you then go to your Hebrew Bible and you run into this stuff and you're like, why am I not recognizing it? Why is this so tricky? It's just because in your Hebrew Bible, you're not as like, he's not, you're not getting this, you know, this uh, heads up of, Hey, here's what you're about to see. So don't get discouraged. If you get in your Hebrew Bible and it's a lot harder, that's natural. Okay. It just takes practice. He gives you so many clues of what to watch out for here so that you can focus on what's important, which is distinguishing between past and present, whether it's the particle of existence or non-existence, or it's the Haya verb and then positive or negative. Does it have the low there? All right. So number one, Haya Navi Ba'aretz. There was a prophet in the land. So this here um, is pretty straightforward, just uh, existence. This is what was there. There was a prophet in the land. This is not possession. There's no Lamed uh, preposition on, um, you know, Ba'aretz, not La'aretz. It's not, there was a prophet for the land, uh, which would be like uh, the land had a prophet. This is just, there was a prophet in the land. Past tense, positive. Lo haya navi ba'aretz. There was not. So here we have the low negating haya. And remember, the low is going to specifically negate the word immediately following. So there was not a prophet in the land. You, same thing. I in navi ba'aretz. There is not a prophet in the land, but here we're in present tense. And then yesh navi ba'aretz. There is a prophet in the land. So ain and yesh. There is not. There is. Haya, lo haya, there was not. There there was, there was not. Okay. So past tense is going to be haya, particles is going to be present. All right. Ye shalom ba malkut. There is peace in the kingdom. Ein gibor sham. There is not a warrior there. Have you guys had gibor? I didn't, I don't remember that in the vocabulary, but I don't think he'd give it to you if you hadn't had it. Lo haya gibor sham. There was not. There was not a warrior there. You could say something like there, yeah. You could say there there was no warrior there. You could, only because it really just means the same thing. But if Hebrew wanted to say there was no warrior there, it might say, lo gibor hayasham. Don't worry about that for now. Number eight, ein zevach al hamil, uh, sorry, uh, al hamizbeach. 
Ein Zevach, Ein Zevach. There, there is no sacrifice Al Hamizbech upon the altar. There is no sacrifice. So this is negative and it is present. Yesh Gibor Al Haderek. There is a warrior on the path. All right, so here we're just introducing uh, uh, possession, it looks like. So, uh, Hayu, ha there were, plural, Hayu, there were uh, for the man, Behemot. Um, this probably means cattle here, Behemot. There were cattle for the man. That means that the man had cattle, not the man has cattle. That would be Yesh Laish, Behemot. But here, the man had cattle, past tense. Lo Hayu Laish Behemot. Uh, there, there were not cattle. There were not for the man cattle. Um, the man didn't have cattle. Past tense. All right. Ain laish behemot. That would mean there is no There is not cattle for the man. So he doesn't. Present tense. He doesn't have cattle. And then of course the positive present tense. Uh, there is for the man cattle. The man does have cattle. Number five. We've got yesh lacha av uh, evadim evadim servants. There are for you servants. You have present tense positive servants. Ain lanu, ain lanu shalom. Uh, there is not peace for us, so we do not have peace. Lo haya lachem kavod. So there is, there was not past tense negative. There was not glory for you. Ain lava, uh, ain labat ach. There was not for the daughter a brother. So the daughter had no brother. Sorry, there is not ain. Ain is present. So just remember, haya hayu, past tense, lo will negate. Ain yesh, present tense. Uh, ain labat ach, there is not a brother for the daughter. The daughter has no brother. And then yesh la'ir, choma, I'm pretty sure choma is wall. Um, there is a wall for the city, so the city has a wall. All right, focusing on ain negating predicate participles. Ain ani, so there is, there is not I, wa, uh, I writing. There is not I writing. Obviously, I am not writing. Ain ani, ain ani is going to be the one CS, so there is not I writing. So same thing, it's just it's a suffix here. I am not writing. Ain ata shomea, so you are not. There is not you. Yeah, there is not you listening. Uh, and then here we've just shifted a ta to a suffix. Ain cha shomea. Uh, there is not you listening, so you are not listening, both. All right, so number five, ain ata botechim. So uh, you all, masculine plural, there is not you all trusting, so you all are not trusting. And then just the suffix form, ain achem, you all are not trusting. Ain hu molech, there is not him, there is not he ruling. So he is not ruling. Ainen, enenu. Again, the the only really diff, the only really difference here, the only really difference between enenu and enenu is context. A covenant. Ah, that's how you tell. Okay, that's how you tell. Perfect. There is something in the participle. Okay, so this is this is really helpful with ain on participles. Okay, so on the participles, when this is three ms, the participle. If it's predicative, the participle is going to be three ms. When this is three, uh, when this is, I should, shouldn't say three ms, but when it's three ms in enenu, the suffix is three ms. The participle will be masculine singular. When um, ooh, yes, because i is here at yod. So when it is one cp, then the participle is going to be plural. All right, so that's how you tell the difference. Uh, enenu ko retim berit is going to be uh, we are not cutting a covenant. All right. That is C, looking at D, focus on infinitives. So number four, because I don't know why he's got these ellipses here. So number four, Kilechto uh, Lirot et Hamilchama. Kilechto, um, when you're looking at that, the first thing that jumps out at me is this to ending. Um, and I think, do we ever add to? So we had T. We had ta, we had, t we never had to. So maybe tav is not part of the holom vav. So let's break it here. I definitely know that we add holom vav as a suffix to things. Usually it's a pronoun suffix. And so depending on what this is, it would either be he, him, or his. But now I have to figure out what all this is. So uh, if I go through, do I ever see kaf lamed kaf as a root? No. 
Do I ever see Lamed Kof Tav as a root? Not as a root, but I do see Lamed Kof Tav together in the word Leket. Now, I don't have Leket. I have Lek To. But the reason why I don't have Leket is because I've added a whole Vav to the end. And when you add a vowel to the end of a word, it's going to cause the vowels in the word to shift often. So this is Leket with the three on a suffix and a cough prepositional prefix. But what in the world is Leket? Well, Leket would have a segel segel tav pattern. Segel segel tav pattern can occur either on a cal active participle, feminine singular, or it can occur as the cal infinitive construct of a one yod vav. Now, if I take off segel segel tav and I take off the cough preposition and the holum vav suffix, and I have lamed kaf and I add a one yod, if I add a yod to the first root letter, I get yalach. But remember, yalach is the adoptive name, adopted name of halach. Halach gets adopted into the one yod vav family, and so it conjugates like a one yod vav. So this is going to be halach. Halach is an infinitive construct, so it would be to walk or to go. The kaf preposition, um, I'm going to translate as as, to go. And then the uh, holum vav suffix could either be he to go or to go him. Could either be the subject of to go or the object of to go. To go, halak, is intransitive. It doesn't take a, an object. So it must be he to go or he going. As he going. So as he went or as he goes, present, or as he will go, future, there's no tense here in an infinitive, so I have to be open. Usually that tense will be determined by the main verb of the sentence, but let's keep going here. So, as he, to walk, we'll keep it for now, lirot, all right? So again, we've got a lamed at the beginning of a word. It's a lamed hiric followed by a letter with a shava. So this is probably my lamed preposition. If I take that off, I get raot. Now, you may not recognize raot immediately, but the holum vav tav suffix tells you that it's probably either a cal active participle, well, if we know it's a verb, a cal active participle masculine, um, feminine plural, or it is a cal infinitive construct. Now, both of those could take a lamed preposition, but um, in this situation, uh, if this were a participle, it, I guess the, the holum, R1, is going to be the difference here. So it would be something like ro oat. So this is not the participle, this would be the infinitive construct of the third he ra. All right, so this lamed could be complementary infinitive, but to go doesn't usually take a complement, uh, or it could be purpose. Now, uh, he went, or he as he went to see the battle. Is there any other way to translate this while he was going to see the battle? Um, I think that cough is going to be temporal. Um, cause any, like, it's not going to be similarity. Cough often expresses similarity, but like he went to see the battle, like you'd need more context there. I don't know why it's just dot, dot, dot. There's not more, but anyways, the translation here, um, would be something like as he goes to see the battle or as he was going to see the battle. All right. Um, that is D let's look at F. All right. That's E F is another translation. Okay. So this will be our last one here. Let's go with, um, we'll do number six. All right, so ha evadim. This is a definite article on evadim. Hirik yod mem tells me that I've got a masculine plural something. Um, is this an adjective, a noun, a participle? Um, well, if it's a participle, it would have a holum. Uh, so this is going to be from eved. Eved is servant. Evadim is servants. The servants ha bonim. This bonim here. This is a participle because I've got a holum. Hirik yod mem suffix. So that's telling me that this is actually um, a uh, plural, and that's what I've got here. So these two match, and we've got the match in definite article. So this would be like the servants who are or were building, or the building servants. You could say the servants building hachoma, the servants building the wall. Yoshvim are dwelling. Yoshvim is from Yeshav. We've got a holom in R1, Hirik Yod Mem. This does not have the article, so we've got an attributive participle here. We've got a predicative participle here. So the servants building the wall are dwelling upon the ground. Maybe they're sitting here. They're staying, they're sitting upon the ground. Ha'adamah, uh, the ground. Le'echol. So echol here, we've got a reduced 
vowel with a holum, theme vowel. This is telling me infinitive. And then the lamed preposition here, uh, obviously aleph as a guttural doesn't want a shava. It takes a, um, a hatef vowel, it takes a composite shava. And aleph here in particular likes that segel. And so the lamed preposition, instead of having a shava, it needs to expand because you can't have two shavas or two reduced vowels in a row at the beginning of the Hebrew word, it needs to restore to a short vowel. And often it restores to hiric, but here it's going to restore to the short vowel corresponding to this reduced vowel. So you get le'echol, is going to be to eat. Uh, so they are sitting on the ground to eat and lishtot. So lishtot here is a little bit complicated, but it's got the holum vav tav ending. So this is either a... Feminine plural noun, feminine plural adjective, it won't be an adjective with the vav, um, and it's got a preposition that looks like, maybe we can't assume that yet, but lamed hiric with a letter with a shava is usually preposition. Uh, so it's either feminine plural participle noun, or it is a uh, infinitive construct of a third hey verb. Lamed preposition on a participle. Doesn't really, like, what function would the noun or the participle have here? Um, this is indicating purpose of an infinitive. Purpose of an infinitive seems like the best match. So if this is an infinitive, we take off the whole and tav here, we add our hay back in, and we get le shita. Shita is to drink, so it fits the context of a hall. And so we get um, the built, the servants building. The servants building the wall are sitting upon the ground in order to eat and to drink. The servants who are building the wall are sitting on the ground to eat and to drink. All right, that's it. If you have any questions, let me know. Hope your week's going well and look forward to jumping in with you next week. Take care.